once you have product, I think it was just we just worked our butts off. I mean, we just you know, we worked hard and we hired people that would work hard and you know, wanted to do well and and kind of off to the races we went. Hey, welcome to All Things Wood Floor, brought to you by Wood Floor Business and sponsored today by one of the most successful wholesale hardwood flooring distributorships in the country, Horizon Forest Products. This episode, we have David Williams, president of Horizon Forest Products and Horizon's own purveyor of profit, Steve Garner. In the last two years, under the direction of David and Steve, Custom Wholesale Flooring, Wood Pro Inc. and Horizon Forest Products were brought together, creating one of the largest, most successful industry distributorships in the nation. Horizon is our very first flooring distributor guest, and I think you'll be interested to hear how they started and where they are today. Horizon is recognized as a powerhouse from Maine to Miami and then one sharp turn all the way to the great state of Texas. Wood Floor Business and Horizon Forest Products are excited to bring you this special episode of All Things Wood Floor. So floor pros around the world, with no further delay, let's get to it. David Williams, Steve Garner of Horizon Forest Products, welcome to All Things Wood Floor. Hey, good evening. Good to be here. Uh, hey, um, guys, David, you would be vice president of Horizon Forest Products? I am, yeah. And Steve, I think from what I understand, you are the you're, you are purveyor of profit. <laughs> that's that's my self-proclaimed um, <laughs> title. <laughs> I love that. Am I right that all of this with you two started way back with Bailey Lumber Company? Is that where we're going? Uh, we actually started before Bailey Lumber, Steve. Uh, started with another company maybe close to 30 years ago. Uh, we opened a branch in Raleigh and uh, teamed up and operated that operation for a few years until we did join the Bailey Opera, uh, organization at that point. So, and that's that was an old company. I think I saw when in '98 they had already had their 75th anniversary or something. Uh, who's that, Bailey? Ba- Bailey. Yeah, I mean Bailey's a almost a hundred year old company at this point, and so it's a family owned business. Uh, they're basically a hardwood lumber sales company that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, they're one of the largest in the, in the world that just does hardwood lumber and they sell lumber all over the world. It's not just in the United States, you know, they sell it, uh, to Europe and, and, you know, the far East. And so they're, they're a, uh, a good company that's been around a long time. And then how did Horizon Forest get its beginnings? Uh, Horizon was opened as a hardwood lumber and plywood company uh, maybe 30 years ago at this point uh, by a couple other people from another company. And uh, they ran it for a few years. It didn't go well. And so Bailey was actually looking uh, to uh, do something with Horizon. Uh, matter of fact, it, it was either close it down or find somebody else to, to run it. And it was just kind of coincidental, if you want to call it that. Um, I was looking to make a change from the company that Steve and I were at. And so we hooked up with Bailey and put a, put a little deal together. And we Steve and I left the other company and took over Horizon which at the time was, you know, one one uh, one branch in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, the the intent was to open a second branch uh, down in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, which is where Steve lived, and so that's what we did. Uh, the first business that we took over Wilmington, Steve. You a UNC Seahawk? Yes, UNCW. That's where I went to um, went to college um, as well. And the only thing David did leave out, we had a little bit of a relationship. We at our other company, we sold Mullican unfinished flooring, and so Bailey had bought Mullican, and um, and, and we were a, a 
you know, we had acquaintances there, good friends and relationships. So, so we could, I know I made calls and made sure, you know, see how it was to work under that Bailey umbrella and everything I heard is positive. In fact, I, I heard this um, last week. Bailey's been around a hundred years, but anybody who knows them, when you mention their name, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about them. Yeah. And that that's hard to find. Um, and, you know, I, I had never really thought about it. Somebody else said it. And I thought, you know, I, I've never heard anything bad about Bailey either. You know, you, you bring that up. I did a little bit, a bit of research, worked with Holly in your marketing department, and she was saying, you know, in 1923, Jim Bailey got into this. And, and you know, he, he, it was all about uh, honesty, integrity, running a business the right way, being competitive. And all this time later, and, and we'll catch up to where I come into this day, boy, you still see it, and they mean it. So let me ask you, when, when all this started to come together, in the beginning, were, were you executives that came in and made big changes, or did you have to do, like, counter sales and make deliveries? And I, I'll answer. Uh, yeah, I'll answer first. Yeah, we did everything. Yeah. I mean, we swept the warehouse. Um, you, you know, I went to auction and bought uh, office supplies. I mean, we, you know, we hooked up fax machines and, you know, file cabinets and, we we did some of everything, IT, HR. I mean, you name it. I I, I still have my CDL license. I'll probably give it up this year, but um, yeah, I still I still have. I used it in 2017 when the hurricane came through and they needed to move material. They have an extra truck, so I jumped in it and you know moved material. Hey, you earned that. Yeah, there's crazy people like me. I still I still sand floors. I don't know why. Somebody calls you out. You got to throw down. You got to bring you got to bring your A game. David, you did the same thing too, right? You were running all over the place, running about every forklifts and. Well, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is when we took over the Horizon operation in Raleigh, uh, it was a uh, a disaster. I mean, that was that, and that's probably a kind word for it. Uh, so we had a lot of cleanup to do, and you know the clock's ticking when you take over a business. Clock starts right when you walk in the front door, so. You know, there's bills to be paid and there's things that need to be sold. And and yet you've got, you know, all of this other work that's got to be done. So uh, I remember being there at, you know, 4 a.m. most days and, you know, getting home at 9 p.m. And it was it was just a difficult first year, to say the least, because we were trying to transition the business from, uh you know, where it was, which was very unprofitable to, you know, at least trying to uh, get it to make a little bit of money. And and that's a tough thing to do. I, I wouldn't want to go do it again, to be honest with you. It's a lot of work. What what was unprofitable? What, were they, what was the model? What were they doing? A counter, a guy, a truck selling flooring or trims? Most of those companies tend to be trim, molding, cabinets, no identity. Was it something they focused on or was it just everything? Yeah, so when we took the business over, uh, Steve and I had some uh, background, and not only the flooring side of the business, but also from the cabinet supply business. And so that means we sold hardwood lumber and hardwood plywood to custom cabinet makers. And so, in essence, that's what this company, that's what Horizon did. They were in the hardwood lumber business and the hardwood plywood business. They didn't really do any flooring. Uh, that we introduced the flooring to the company, and so we were just basically selling that lumber and plywood to anybody that would take it. And and the big problem was, <laughs> and I didn't we didn't discover this until we got there, but they had absolutely ruined the name Horizon uh, in that the guys that were running it. Uh, Let's say they were less than honest about their business practices. And so <laughs> I remember walking into some customers trying to, because we knew who they had sold to before, walking in and, and they just literally said, out, out, out. Uh, don't come in here. Because they had apparently been done wrong uh, by the previous guys that were running the business. So, 
not only are you trying to get the business out of the ditch, but you've got customers that actually are, you know, uh, not real happy to do business with you. So you're trying to rebrand the thing uh, and say, hey, that was the other guys, not us. And so it's it's an uphill climb when you take over a business like that. Was this something that uh, one of you jumped out first and dragged the other one in, or you just knocked heads and said, we're going to do this together? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I was trying to do the Raleigh operation, and Steve was in Wilmington uh, getting the Wilmington branch up and, and going. So he was really on a different path, uh, down in the Wilmington area than I was up in Raleigh. And so, uh, he was able to create his own identity down in, in the Wilmington market where I was trying to recreate the identity. And so, you know, we, we all, we both had our, our challenges, uh, because, one of the things we wanted to do for sure was uh, get the business into the hardwood flooring side of business. Um, and, and at the time, uh, you know, when you're a new guy in that distribution business, you've got to really work hard to uh, find someone that will actually sell you the product because, you know, a lot of manufacturers have their own distribution outlets and they, they're just not open to opening more distribution outlets. And so, you know, you're kind of begging on one side and, and, and trying to find, uh, you know, just supply to, to buy. And so uh, it, it's, a cha- it's more of a challenge than you think. What, what was it that made you say, you know, it's hardwood flooring that that's where we're going to make our bones? You know, if I was to guess... Uh, it was probably from the previous place we came from. It was probably 90% of what we did uh, with 10% of that lumber plywood business. Uh, so we had a lot of expertise, if you want to say that, in the flooring side. And so that's where we knew that we wanted to take the business. And, and, and you know, at the same time, keep the lumber plywood stuff going but we wanted to really get the flooring up and going because we felt like the opportunity was better there. What was it that got you in the game where you, you got a stronghold in it, you got a grip on things and you had the ability to kind of grow and move forward. Was it the ability, some people I find it's their ability to just pay their bills or to be good to their vendors or give newer upcoming vendors a chance. What was it that got you a good grip on what you had? Well, what do you think, Steve? Well, one, I'll say the the backing of and backing and support of of Bailey, uh, obviously, in in those early years, um, you know, they they've always been um, supportive. Beyond that, like David said, I mean, we were trying everything. We, you know, we would work with a mill, and and they may not sell us their branded product. And this is even unfinished. They wouldn't sell us their branded unfinished. So we even had a private label unfinished flooring made for us. Um, You know, and we were trying, you know, you had to try meals that sometimes people had never heard of. Um, You had to have something to sell. And then at that point, once you have product, I think it was just, we just worked our butts off. I mean, we just, you know, we worked hard and we hired people that would work hard and, you know, wanted to do well and, and kind of off to the races we went. It was just a lot of hard work. Were there, were there really, you know, big powerhouse distributors that you had to kind of go at and ankle bite and, you know, was that what it was or, or, or was it a fairly even playing field in that area? I mean, I, I think co- the competitors that were there then are still around now. I mean, yeah, I mean, the the big one that we were up against at the time was Haynes. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, they're still a, I mean, they, they're they they're between Raleigh and Wilmington is, is where, you know, uh, well, it's where they have a huge warehouse in, in Goldsboro. I guess their corporate offices are now up in Baltimore. Um, but, you know, that's a company that's been, you know, been around for 100 years and, um, you know, you know, you see what's happened at this point. So, Don't you think that there is something a little different about being uh, in touch with hardwood flooring? It For me, it's always seemed like we're involved in something bigger. It's a craft. It's important. 
um, it's woodworking the legacy. Yeah. It, it it is. I mean, uh, yeah, it it it's one of those things where there's very few people. Once you get into the industry, people obviously move around, but there's not a lot of people that ever leave the industry. No. Now we used to say that one guy got out, Tom Cruise, but he'll be back. There's no way <laughs> he's going to do what he's doing any longer. When you first started, did you have job site delivery and job unloads? Because when I was down in Florida, they didn't touch that. It was just went to the driveway and they dumped it. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that's probably the second part that kind of helped us get over the hump was uh, we really committed to the service side of the business. And so, you know, we committed that. Uh, you could have a- actually same day service uh, delivery, and uh, so you call in an order, and I don't care when it came in, we were going to bring it to you if you needed it right then. And so, uh, you know, we still try to have that type of service mentality to this date. Uh, is we we want to have the products in stock that you need, and we also want to be able to get it to you. Uh, as quick as you need it uh, or whenever you need it. And so the goal is to make sure that, you know, the the flooring contractor has the products that he needs every day to do his job. Well, I know, uh, Steve, I know a story about you where we, I know in the early days there was a customer I had spoken to, I think in Baltimore somewhere that it said, you know, a lot of people to choose from. He got stuck on a job after hours with Horizon closed and ran out of polyurethane. And not that they didn't open the store. They got in their vehicle, brought all the finish out to this guy's job so he could get it done and finish it. That's the kind of customer service that it still exists today with all your organizations, correct? Yeah, yeah. And I think you, you guys do do the same. I mean, customers have your your cell phone number, and if they need something, they call you. I mean, it's it's... It, you know, that's um, going from like outside sales to leading a branch and then, you know, changing roles. That was the the biggest part for me is, you know, it wasn't that I quit calling on customers. It was I quit visiting my friends. From the beginning, did you always set the bar high? A lot of people, I know people that own businesses, they'll be happy to give it to you. But when you have a business that's productive and you, you know you got a grip on something, you just keep the bar high, don't you? Yeah, I think so. I mean... Uh, we're a very aggressive company and we're always, you know, uh, we feel like our standards are pretty high that, uh, we want to do it right every time. Now, you know, nobody's perfect, but if our goal is to do it right every time, then I think it comes across to the customers that, Hey, these guys do care about what they're doing and they want to do it right. And they, they want my business and, we try to we try to do that, you know. And like Steve just said, uh, you know, we've we've got great personal relationships with customers too. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. Uh, one of our uh, flooring uh, contractors uh, on Monday uh, ha- had a heart cath, and they put a stand in. Uh, so I talked to him before he went into the. Uh, to the, if you call it surgery. Uh, and then I, you know, I've called him, I called him yesterday and I called him today just to check on him to, to make sure he's okay. See if he needs anything. I mean, you don't find in this day and time a whole lot of businesses that, you know, the vice president of the company that you do business with calls you to check on you when you're going to have surgery. So now, you know, I will say I don't, you know, I'm not able to do that for every uh, customer we've got, but uh, you know, I try to I try to be involved with our customers and and make sure that if they need some help, we're there to help them. How is it different in the beginning when you started? Is the model in distribution for hardwood flooring any different over the last two decades? You know, in the distribution part of of our industry. You know, there's some good players, and then there are what what I would call some average players. Uh, the good players really are intentional to have the best products and the best people for their customers. And so, when you know, a lot of companies say that, uh, but 
uh, I would hate to try to guess the amount of money we have spent over the past 25 years with the education side of our business for our employees. And so, uh, you know, I know, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows of uh, businesses that you call and, you know, you, you, you got to know what your customer number is to even talk to someone. And then whoever you talk to really can't give you an answer about, you know, what uh, a number one common red oak should look like, or uh, you got to talk to somebody else. We spend a, a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy simply training our people uh, to know those answers. And so when you call one of our branches, uh, whoever answers the phone, to be honest with you, uh, should be able to answer almost any question you have about the wood or the finish or the sandpaper or the tools that we sell. And so we're, we're very intentional about making sure that our people are uh, a great resource for our customers. Well, you're a, you have um, you provide for everyone the NWFA University, correct? Right. I know that I know that's competitive because every now and then they'll leak a little email that will tell you who who studied a little more this month. Steve, do you think that um, when you got things got the ball rolling? Once you got a grip on everything, what was next? Because you had those locations. What came after that? More locations or just making the other ones bigger and better? How did you proceed from there? Uh, well, a combination. Continue to grow what you have. But, yes, it was – David and I, I mean, we always you know, worked together and talked and all that. But, yeah, so I got Wilmington up and going, and then the next thing I did is – I, you know, I started building a market in Charleston with the intent to open a place in Charleston. While I was doing that, David was building a, a market in Greensboro to get Greensboro op open and started. So, it, you know, we would work together and talk about what was working well and what weren't. And, and you know, and we shared some salespeople, you know, um, just, you know, doing what we could to, to help keep the growth going. So. Well, it seems like your your operations in, let's say, Florida or, or the Carolinas or even Virginia appear to be two to four hours away. And then you, you've got our little shops up here that are all 45 minutes to an hour of each other. It's it's different, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's different. Uh, yes, definitely uh, different. Um, well, you just think about, like you said, the, the markets you're in up north versus the markets in Florida. I mean, they're in major cities, you know, in, in Florida – um, you know, but the population, I mean, I guess that's what the exciting part is the, um, you know, the, the growth you have seen in just the, the two years that we've been involved. I mean, you know, we expect that to continue for, for some time. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll provide everything that anybody needs. So I, I think that's the, that's the fun part is, um, uh, you know, and the rewarding part, I guess, is the better word to say, is providing opportunities for so many people. And and that's that's really what Bailey has done for us. And that's what we're trying to do for other people. Did, did it seem like a really quick move from what you started and to where you are today? What what's the time span between you getting up, getting running and and, and now you got the whole East Coast? When how long did that take you? You guys uh, came out of nowhere August. for us. It was boom. Here's these guys. Next thing you know, we're all working together. <laughs> we started. We we went to work at Horizon in August of '97. So 25 years was the span, and you know, you, you go through a lot of different uh, opportunities. I mean, we're always looking for that next opportunity. Uh, uh, typically in markets that can support a, uh, a branch or a location. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, you got to consider the, the periods like 2008. I mean, uh, we're talking some extreme difficult situations there. Of how do you get our business through this and, you know, keep it going? I mean, it, it was... You know, we literally lost 50% of our business 
within a few months. And I don't, I don't think too many businesses can lose that much of their business and not go out of business. And a lot of them did, to be honest with you. Uh, but we were able to, uh, you know, work smart, make some hard decisions and, uh, you know, came out of that probably better than we, when we went into it. So, uh, those are difficult times. And, you know, I, th- I think that, you know, another one of those is coming at some point, you got to be ready for it. So it's just kind of the business cycles that we go through. So it's not all been, you know, go out and grow and expand. It's, it's also managing through those difficult periods too. It's like you said, it was brutal. And somehow, what happened? We pull out of it not that far later. We get back-to-back pandemics, which was not a piece of cake either. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, managing a, a distribution operation with, you know, a, a extremely sl- small margins uh, is it, certainly a challenge when you go through those bumpy periods. And so... You've got to make a lot of hard choices and you got to make a lot of good choices quickly, to be honest with you. A lot, a lot of business people want to make, want to keep pushing that, that, uh, decision down the road. And the longer you do that, the worse it is. And so it's, it's just important that, that you decide on what you're going to do, uh, and do it. And, and then figure out what the next step is. So uh, we've been through a couple of those and, you know, not looking forward to going through any more. But uh, I think we learn every time we go through something like that. Even the pandemic, I mean, you know, we were able to manage through that, you know, just fine. Uh, but you have to really be serious about, you know, what, what your intentions are and what your they're trying to get done and and what is it going to take to get it done uh so but then you know to be honest with you when we when we go into either a recession or a pandemic i've always told my people i live about five years down the road so uh we're in the middle of any of those type situations i'm thinking all right all right we got to get through this but what do we need to be doing to prepare ourselves for the next upswing or what do we need to do to prepare as soon as we get out of this, what's it going to look like and what do we need to do to, uh, be ready to, you know, uh, take care of that business. And so hopefully with that type of mindset of forward thinking, you can uh, you can actually capitalize on the business as it starts to take off, and you can be ready to 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 help your customers, you know, take their business to the next level. Because if if you're if you're always pulling back and you're always trying to hunker down, uh, then when you get out of that situation, uh, you're not ready to help your customers. And I think it's more important to kind of think down the road a little bit and figure out what do I do to get ready to take care of these customers. Do you think you pulled any positives out of the pandemic? Some of the parameters of the pandemic itself in regards to uh, relationships and how you have to treat employees or treat customers, uh, I don't know, I just... I don't like to separate people. And whenever you're having to put plexiglass up at your counter so that someone can't talk to you, you know, you're talking around the plexiglass kind of thing. It it just, you know, it makes me uncomfortable because our, I I believe our business is built on relationships. Absolutely. You're putting a barrier between, you and your customer, like a stupid piece of plexiglass, I just think it, it it's you know it sends the wrong message. And I you know I wanted those things down as soon as possible because I just we don't need that. And, and then it's the same thing with the employees. I mean we're we're having to separate people, and you know you can't go any closer to this. And 
you can't go to the bathroom if somebody else is in there. And uh, I, I, I wanted to get through that and get back to, uh, you know, better relationships between the people as quick as possible. Well, yeah. Well, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I was going to say along those lines, I mean, one of the things that I'll say that we really, I know I really enjoy, and I, I know a lot of our customers really enjoy it, is we, we like to do special uh, things with a lot of our customers. We Over the years, we've done a lot of um, trips where we'll, you know, where we can invite some customers and they can take their spouses and the pandemic put a stop to all of that. Even, I mean, I think you, you, know, you, you probably recognize that we like to get together in person, um, you know, as a leadership team to, to help grow together and, and that kind of thing. And the pandemic put a lot of uh, put a halt on a lot of that because of air travel and, and just parameters with hotel rooms and you know everything that's involved there. We've been able to do it a little bit, but we haven't been able to do it um, to the level that we did pre pre pandemic. This pandemic, as we're pulling out of it, there's so much opportunity. I, I think one of the things between the economy turning and then the recession coming is I've seen the hardwood flooring contractor go from 50 years of $1.50, $1.75 to $4 to sand and $4 to finish. And God bless them. They're finally getting paid their due and there are not enough of them. And I hope they never bring their prices down. They deserve it. They're feeding their families. Um, the cost of what they're doing is it's so expensive, and they're coming to us as experts and building that relationship, which could last decades. And now their children are coming up through and finding that maybe a really expensive education isn't exactly for them. Maybe it's a vocation. Maybe it's a skill, whether it's construction, drywall, contracting, whatever. I've seen the experts in the field who we need more than anything are – even that more educated, even that more focused, if we could just get more people to train from them. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the trades, and I think, uh, I, I, I'm hoping we'll see some improvement on that because when you're doing it, uh, like you described at $1.50 a foot, I mean, I just don't think it's enough. Uh, now that it's, you know, more appealing from the financial side, I do think you'll see more people looking at it and becoming interested in, you know, learning that type of a trade and uh, get it. And, and we should have hopefully an influx of, uh, of, of new people that can get into this business. This episode of All Things Wood Floor is brought to you by Horizon Forest Products. Horizon Forest Products offers customers over 75 years of industry experience and one of the most comprehensive inventories of pre-finished and unfinished hardwood flooring, floor equipment, abrasives, finishes, fasteners, and accessories. Horizon Forest Products loves their customers, and it shows. Give them a call, and they'll show you why they continue to be one of the fastest-growing hardwood distributors in the U.S. Find out more at www.horizonforest.com. You know, Steve, you've worked with us and me on, on product development. And, you know, it's interesting. I went into a meeting with you once and, and somebody asked, um, hey, I really got to sell this particular urethane because if I don't, I'm going to lose Larry, the contractor. And you go, give it to me, give it to me. And you took out a calculator and you go, which sales, which numbers, what's the volume, how much does he do a year? And you go, hold on. You go, yeah, no, dump that item. Good. Let's move on. And like, there you go. <laughs> There, you can't sell everything. You can't be everything to everybody. What's your core? You must look at some base core and go, okay, here's what the staples are that we need to do the best at and roll our money into. And, and what are they? Um, I guess when I think about products, like you said, I want quality. Um, you know, I want to work with a, a manufacturer that's going to, you know, come in and help train our people. Um, and, you know, obviously I want something that's, that's appealing, um, to a, to a vast majority of our customers. And, and one of the things I've always thought about is, you know, you always, in my mind, you always want at least the top two brands. 
you, you know, you want the, you know, the Cadillac, you want the, you know, the Rolls Royce, whatever you want Coke, to call Pepsi. it. Yep. And, and, and you also want, a, you know, I'll say, a, a, you know, a, whoever number two is behind, behind them. You know, if you can, if you can get number one and two, that's probably going to cover, you know, 80% of the market. You're always going to have, you know, somebody that wants some oddball brand just to be different. Um, but you have to do a lot of work. Um, like you say, people don't realize how much it takes to bring in that item. I mean, you, you got to, you know, somebody's got to buy it. You know, somebody has to unload it. Somebody has to put it on the shelf. Somebody has to pay the bill. Somebody has to count it for inventory. And you have to do that over and over and over again in a year. And so if if the if it's not moving the needle, you know, we should probably, you know, take a look at it and, and get rid of it. Is it different uh, drastically or not from what you see in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, to the middle states, to New England? Like, for instance, here, LVT was not a thing, and it's be- it's finally becoming a thing. Are we behind the South on trendsetters like that? I'm going to say yes, but it's one of those things where the, the cycle. One of the things I'm seeing is um, the the HGTVs or the, you know, the television um, shows that are pushing the vinyl and the water, the, the term waterproof. The homeowner is coming in and requesting it. And even a lot of the dealer salespeople, you know, it's easy. I do think some of those products have been over marketed because we're seeing here in the South um, people that put in vinyl in houses, at, you know, at a certain price range. And I'll just say, you know, five hundred thousand dollars and up because we're seeing some of those products that look like wood imitation wood that are going into those houses and those people had real wood before they're being sold a product that looks like wood and being told that it's better because it's waterproof or or whatever or scratch resistant and we're seeing some of those jobs that we delivered you know four or five three four or five years ago People are replacing that with real wood now. It, it's just not the same. It you know it doesn't sound the same. It doesn't feel the same. They thought they were going to like it better because that's kind of what they were told and that's what they had seen on TV. And it's pretty and it looks okay. It's it's just not the same. So I, I do think you're going to you know I, I hope to continue to see that trend of real wood continuing to to come back because right now, you know, there's vinyl that looks like wood, tile that looks like wood, laminate that looks like wood, SPC, WPC. I mean, all these things, they're trying to duplicate the real thing or make it look like the real thing. David, you make, do you typically prognosticate? I mean, I know that uh, you share a lot of material with your salespeople, et cetera, about industry forecasts economically and looking ahead. Do you think that, that's something we look ahead to and at least do our best to figure out where we may be headed and to plan accordingly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we talked about 2008 a few minutes ago, and that was one of the things that uh, I think we did as good a job as anybody I know in preparing for that. Now, you know, I follow – uh, a group of economists, uh, the company's called ITR, and uh, I've followed those guys for a long time. And uh, I guess through the early 2000s, you know, everything was good. We talked about the 2006, 2007, everything's great. Uh, during that time, these guys were saying, hey, hold up, uh, we got some trouble coming. And we need to pay attention to this and you need to start making some changes. So we did that. Uh, In 2007, you know, we're uh, looking for expenditures to kind of cut back on. We're looking for not rehiring people when uh, they moved on or, or, or vacated a position. And, 
when 2008 hit for us, uh, we were actually very prepared for it. And uh, I, I think one of the only companies I've ever talked to in our industry that that made money through 2008. Now, you know, granted, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but I've talked to other uh, distribution companies that really lost a lot of money. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and when you get into that situation uh, that you're almost panicking, you make bad decisions. And I think that those companies actually lost a lot of good people because they hit the panic button because they had to figure out how to, you know, resize themselves according to whatever the, you know, the business was. We were already resized. Uh, and so we held, you know, there's a difference in when you get into a tough situation of cutting the fat. There's a difference in that and cutting the good meat. And, uh, uh, you know, we had cut our fat a long be- way before 2008. And so we, we were very prepared and we, we rode out and aggressively were ready. Uh, as we got into 2009 and 2010, we had good people on board that were ready to roll. We had products that were ready to roll because we had set, you know, resized our offerings. And uh, so I say all of that in that, uh, you know, I still follow these ITR guys uh, and I share that with all of our people in, in the leadership team company. Uh, to be honest with you, they're not really calling for uh, a recession. Uh, they're calling for, you know, uh, business to uh, readjust, if you want to call it that. Uh, but what you have to keep in mind is 2001 and 2002 were actually <laughs> way out of proportion in regards to business. So, I mean, if you compare your one and two numbers to your 2019 numbers or 20 numbers, you were way up. So, you know, and and it was, to be honest with you, it was unsustainable uh, what we went through. We couldn't get supply. Prices were going through the roof. It it was unsustainable. And so as as we kind (laughs) of... readjust to where normal is. Uh, some people say, hey, that's a recession. I say that's a, 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 an adjustment back to normal. And that's how we're looking at this is that adjustment back and, and, and keep your head down and, and keep going because there's still business out there. Being smart about those economic changes and what's coming in, it's all part of the game. It's not just show up and sell. It's you know, plan your business and, and stick to your plan. Yeah, I'm I'm a uh, analytical kind of guy. I want to see the numbers. I want to base plans and projections off of real numbers, uh, and I don't want to base it off the six o'clock news. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I, no. Steve and I were talking about this the other day. We've pretty much gotten away from the six o'clock news. I mean, it's you know, it's not good, I think, for business people to hang out in that uh, rhetoric too much. You know, if something really big or bad happens, I want to know about it. But uh, just the daily, you know, onslaught of, of bad news or, you know, trying to frighten people, I think it... it, it it's not good for us uh, in the business world, and it's not good for us to try to make solid, clear business decisions when we're when that's all we're hearing in our ear. Give me give me the numbers. Tell me tell me how things look or don't look, and, and let's base base our plans accordingly. So that's that's kind of how I look at things. Do you think? What are the biggest challenges we're facing? There's got to sum them up for me. We know the economy is one. Well, the economy is one. 
What you got, Steve? Oh, no, I, I, I was just thinking, I, I think the biggest challenge is people. I mean, it's it's finding the, you know, finding and keeping the, the good ones. And, you know, Dave, I mean, you know, you, you've been talking about that, I mean, about, you know, um, you know, making sure that, that, you know, our people are happy and we have a good work environment and good culture and, you know, we take care of them and, you know, we, we do a, a lot of good things for, for our people, but, uh, you know, that is the challenge right now is trying to find, find more good people to help take us to the next level. Well, Steve, you're, we're, no one's impervious to this. Tell me about supply lines. That's seems I'm, I'm having issues of uh, competition is friends are reps that come in. It's uh, you see it more than anybody. What is going on in the last several months or year with our supply chains and where is it all going haywire? Um, it, I, well, I, I feel like it, it on most products, you know, obviously what 2021, we, you know, we just couldn't buy enough of anything. I mean, everything was, it, it seemed like on top of the pandemic, you had the shipping problems on top of the shipping problems. You had the, the freeze in Texas that, that just demolished, you know, all, you know, anything that was using chemicals that kind of went through a lot of those plants in Texas you know, adhesives and levelers and finishes and stain. I mean, it, all of that, just um, most of that, th there's still some issues, um, but they're more isolated. But like, I'll just say, like container cost. I mean, container cost got crazy. They went from, you know, $2,800 to $22,000. Like David said, that's just unsustainable when you're adding you know, a, a dollar of, you're paying more for the freight to get the product here than you're paying for the product. It, you know, it's, it's just not sustainable. But I, I mean, I heard this week, I mean, we, you know, we just got in a, a small container, we paid three grand. You know, some of the 40 foot containers are back down to, you know, six and 8,000. So, so it is correcting, and you, you've seen the domestic prices. Domestic supply is plentiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that, you know everybody's wanting to sell more and more. And I wish we could, uh, you know, we're doing all that we can to 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 try to do that to to grow our market share on, on the domestic products to to keep that moving and to help our suppliers. I mean, that's what we want to do. We want to. We want to help them, it, but it does them no good and us no good to buy it and set it in our warehouse. So, so we got to push it through. But I, I do see, you know, the freight thing uh, again. The the war could impact that, but um, you know that that has loosened up. Supply overseas has loosened up. Um, so things are getting better. Obviously, you see it at the pump too. Now I just wish diesel would fall like um, <laughs> like regular fuel. Oh yeah, that's. I saw diesel fuel pricing the other day, and watching our drivers fill up, and and you're like, is this going to end? It's 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 through the roof. It, are are you seeing any particular product lines and items that are particularly affected by the war? Was it engineered flooring uh, material? Is it is it it's adhesive and chemicals? Is it really just the Chinese and Russian imports? Well, I mean, yeah, you you look at it. It's it it is it's engineered mostly made domestically um, because a lot of those domestic engineers use the Baltic birch um, as their, as their core. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know how that's going to, to finally shake out because a lot of people came out with a lot of different alternatives, which is great, but they're untested. Right. And it takes it really, it takes time to to truly test some of those items, and I think you're going to see, like David said, some people that you know couldn't get or 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 haven't been able to to keep their supply of Baltic birch may go into panic mode and try some products that are untested, and that you know that that could be a that could be a costly or bad decision if things go wrong. That makes sense. You think um, the model for now and moving forward, et cetera, uh, if I asked either one of you, what's um, Horizon's greatest asset? I, I mean, I'll, I'll answer. I mean, the, the 
I, I, I'll go back to it's it's the same answer as our hardest challenge, and that's our people. Sure. I mean, you know, it's um, you know, for me, I mean, that's that's what the business is built around. I mean, honestly, that's how we got into Texas. It was we we had a good person that just wanted to move to Texas, and he came to us and said, "Hey, you know, would y'all like to have a place in Texas?" We're like. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's it's just people. I mean, that's I mean, everything else we can supply. I mean, we can rent buildings and trucks and buy more product and all that. It's it's just having the right people. I mean, and that's the only thing that holds us back too is finding more good people because as we find more and more good people, you know, we can expand, you know, wherever whenever we want. What is it that each of you in your careers whether it's just your career or the industry that you're really proud of? Uh, well, you know, Dave, I'll, I'll say that uh, it's probably the uh, probably two things. One is the opportunity that we've given our people to, to prosper. We have people that are leading branches that used to drive trucks. You know, we've got people that used to work in the warehouse that are now in charge of, you know, parts of the business that are uh, very important. Uh, so, you know, I'm proud that we've we've been able to, to grow as a company and grow our people uh, at the same time. I just don't like leaving people behind. I want to make sure as we grow forward that we – Make sure we bring everyone with us. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. Uh, I just <laughs> I just had a situation in one of our branches where I walked in and uh, the guy at the sales counter uh, had a nice new shirt on, had a golf shirt on. And, and I said, David, I said, what are you doing? And uh, he said, I, I'm. Uh, I'm learning inside sales. Now, this was a warehouse guy that uh, has been with us a, a year or two, and great work ethic, smart, and we had an opportunity to put him into a, an inside sales position, and obviously, we wanted to give him that opportunity because we see potential in him, and so... It just, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm so proud of how our company look, looks at our people and says, hey, we want to help you be better. And so uh, I think for me, as I go from place to place and visit our branches and, and our operations, I see so many of those situations. And I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just excited about you know, what it means to that employee and what it means to that employee's family. Uh, I've learned, I learned a long time ago that that employee is attached to a family somewhere. And if we can help lift that employee, then we lift that family. And that means a lot to me. And so as we continue down the road, that's my goal is to make sure we're always looking to help lift our people to the next level. Do you find that um, it's on your radar, and you talked about taking care of people, that, that corporate culture, is that a thing? Like there, there needs to be a defined horizon corporate culture. I mean, I guess I'll say, I don't know that it has to be horizon corporate culture, but I guess the corporate culture that we want is, you know, David said it earlier, we want people that, are passionate about what they do, um, want to do things well, um, you know, and they want to set goals for themselves, set goals for the company. Um, you know, that that's the kind of person we can, like you said, we can teach everything else, sure. um, but you can't put that into people. They have to kind of have that or, or be self-motivated themselves. But if they have that good attitude and the passion to, to want to do well, like you said, we can we can teach them about wood flooring, and you know you can teach them about 
selling and we have other people, you know, we'll, we can train everything else. So, you know, if we have those ingredients, um, you know, David's big on saying, you know, we got to find the, the right seat on the bus. Well, if you find a good person, you know, we'll find the seat. Um, you know, we got to learn about the person and see what they like and what they enjoy, what they're good at, because that that's what people are going to enjoy is most of the time they're it's something they're good at or passionate about or like doing. Y- you find that seat for them and they're going to help your they're going to help your company. I mean, you know, I mean, I I could go through examples, but I could uh, you know, I could name names. But, you know, the people listening to this podcast won't know them. But. I mean, we've created positions for good people, um, put them in those positions, and they have helped the company become more profitable in a position that wasn't even there before. But do you guys take a break? I mean, you, I, I'm pretty sure you're golfers. What are you doing when you're not running this place? You must be doing something in your spare time. Yeah, golf is my thing, Steve. So I try to do golf, but uh... – also, I'm a happy grandpa now, and so I've got grand, grand grandbabies, and uh, trying to get more time with with those little ones. And so, I, I've you know, I've entered a different season of life with having grandbabies. And so, uh, I love to play golf. We do a you know, we try to do a lot of that as as we can. But uh, fam, families pretty important too as as i've changed roles from dad to granddad so and steve what do you got going yeah i mean i i enjoy playing golf so i i I would say three things for me golf um lori and i my wife uh, love to travel uh like to there's so many places around the world to see even you know even just in this country that was another thing the pandemic kind of you know, um, knock some of some of that out. And then I enjoy um, uh, learning about and investing in real estate. So I so those three things, golf, travel and real estate. So All right. I'm going to ask you all you get to do is give me a quick answer and we'll go back and forth. And we'll start with Steve. Steve, if you weren't in the wood flooring industry, what would you be doing? Um. I would either own some kind of business or do what your wife does, and that's real estate. Absolutely. David? Uh, I love uh, running a business. So if it, would, if it wasn't this business, I would be in some sort of a business uh, looking to take it to the next level. Steve, is there anybody in the industry that you haven't met that you might meet or work with? Um. I, um I'll tell you, I, I just, not a specific person, and, and I mentioned this earlier, I, I love doing outings with customers, um, and I'm looking forward to getting back to doing that, and so we'll, we'll be doing more of that in 2023, and I mean, it. you just create memories, you grow friendships, you build relationships, um, so n- I don't, I don't want to say a particular person. I just enjoy spending that time with a lot of our customers and vendors. We, we invite vendors as well. And David, anybody in the industry or, or in business in general that you think you would like to meet? You know, I take a lot of my uh, business uh, leadership fundamentals from coaches. And so, you know, there, there's, there are probably two or three football coaches I'd love to meet and talk to. I'd love to have been able to talk to John Wooten, you know, uh, a guy like that that uh, was so successful in leading a team. Uh, I just think the crossover, and I use this a lot, the crossover between business and athletics is huge. And so I think it's always the coach you know he's not he's not in the game, but his influence over the the team in the game is amazing, and you can see the difference in great coaches and maybe just even good coaches and how successful they they are. So there are some of those that I'd like to meet. All right, David, back to you then. Anybody that coming up through the ranks, even from way back, way back, way back after high school, college, etc., that's been a mentor or a guru or somebody you look back and go, I'm glad I had that person in my career or my life. 
Yeah. Uh, so for for a long time now, I have studied and tried to learn leadership. And so John Maxwell is is kind of the guy that I've probably read more of his books. I don't know at this point, eighty or ninety books that he's read, uh, written. Uh, our you know our our company and our our leadership team uh, is always involved in some sort of a John Maxwell uh, leadership book. So he has probably been the most influential in in my business uh, life. Steve, any individual mentors, people, anything, business, life? Um, I don't know. I don't want to say, well, I mean, I've worked with David. (laughs) So um, outside of that, um, I don't want to say anybody in particular. I, I, I guess I will say that reading, listening to podcasts, and setting aside time to set goals, but not only set goals, do take action on those goals. Um, that has probably helped me more than than anything else. And and actually, I mean, David mentioned it, and and he got me started on this. I guess you know, learning of leadership and um, success journey by John Maxwell. It's one of like the first one of the first leadership books I read. I don't know if it's still in print or not, but um, I read that, and that that's all about. I mean, it starts off by telling you, you know, by setting goals. But you know, I like reading books about other things as as well. So, um, but I think constant learning. Um, I guess that would you know constant learning and pushing yourself to kind of be outside of your comfort zone um, really pays off. Um, I think too many people get in that comfort zone and don't want to get out of it. And, and I think that holds the, they hold themselves back by not challenging themselves and getting outside of that comfort zone. I've read a lot of Maxwell, but I guess I now have about 85 books coming my way. I will say <laughs> The Five Levels of Leadership was was brilliant. I, I enjoyed that. Anything, Steve, that really it, it just gets under your skin in our industry? Is there a pet peeve that you go, where, why, why, why? Sometimes when there's a problem involved, a lot of times it, it is because I think sometimes homeowners think that all dealers or flooring contractors are the same. I mean, and, and they may not do their homework on, you know, getting references or checking them out or, or that kind of thing. They may just compare price and that I don't I don't think sometimes they value the, the craftsmanship and, and what those guys the knowledge they have and the skill they have and what it takes to do things the right way in flooring. And, and so, you know, I, when, you know, I, I guess, yeah, when, when, when the blame wants to get pushed somewhere and, and sometimes it, it may need to be pushed back at the, at the homeowner because they didn't do their homework or, or, that kind of thing and just hired somebody that like you said earlier, they may do, you know, windows and doors and other things and wood floors and 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 they don't they're they're not true craftsmen and they you know, they don't make their full time living doing floors. And David, anything that flips your light switch that just just runs up you sideways? Uh, I would think I think that uh, the uh, companies and people in general in our industry undervalue themselves. So I think suppliers undervalue what they do to provide products. I think distributors undervalue the services that they provide and the contractors and retailers and dealers all undervalue what they do now. I get the competition side of, of running businesses, uh, but I do think way too many of us work too hard 
and uh, simply undervalue what we do and are not paid, uh, you know, accordingly. So that that kind of, you know, I gripe about that from time to time uh, when I'm talking to others in our industry that, hey, you know, we work too hard to not make uh, make better in this industry. And so that would be my gripe. Well, both of you made your bones in this industry. This is part of your life. You got carpet in your house. Is there, with all you've invested, is there carpeting in either of your homes? <laughs> I want to know. I, I, I can, I can honestly say no carpet in 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 my houses. I'll even go a step further. I own a lot of rental property. I've never put a piece of carpet even in a rental property. There you go. David, you got a shag van from the 60s or something that you, you put fur on the ceiling. You got rugs in that house. I mean, that house doesn't look like there's any carpet in there. The only carpet I've got is a bonus room. And uh, uh, and it's because uh, the boss of the house says that when the grandbabies are here, uh, she wants something soft for them to, to be on. So that's... There's one room in this whole house, and that's it. Guys, I really appreciate you taking the time. We talked about everything. If we do this more often, we'll probably solve all the world's problems. But I want to thank you both for taking the time chatting with me. Uh, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. This episode of All Things Wood Floor was sponsored by Horizon Forest Products. Horizon Forest Products offers customers over 75 years of industry experience and one of the most comprehensive inventories in the industry. All Things Wood Floor is brought to you by Wood Floor Business Magazine. If you liked this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to All Things Wood Floor so you don't miss an episode. And make sure you sign up for a print subscription to Wood Floor Business at woodfloorbusiness.com.